actually, when you think about it, an empty tomb by itself isn't p particularly impressive evidence for anything. I couldn't agree more. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. Today is the third in our once in a while series covering capturing Christianity's three and a half hour loads of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus epic podcast featuring Dr. Callum Miller and Dr. Max Baker Heitch. Tap on the playlist above my head if you want to catch the series from the beginning. Otherwise, we're picking up where we left off, working through the resurrection creed in 1 Corinthians, shifting from the burial of Jesus to the notion of an empty tomb. Good. Well, I mean, that's the creed is a, a good place to start because actually it just gives an opportunity to look at what I would say is the major argument against uh, the historicity of the empty tomb which is that Paul doesn't explicitly mention it in this creed. It is correct that the verse contains no mention whatsoever of a tomb, empty or otherwise. If Corinthians was our only source for the resurrection, we'd have no idea whatsoever of the manner of Jesus' burial, and would assume that Jesus' appearances were the first clues given to anyone of his return. As this is also the earliest written record of the event, we can't be confident if the empty tomb tradition was already circulating, or if that was a later development. That's the trouble with silence. It's not very helpful. An argument from silence is where you say, this source doesn't mention X, therefore X probably didn't happen. Obviously, arguments from silence are quite precarious in general, uh, especially in ancient history. Just the mere fact that Paul doesn't explicitly mention it uh, doesn't seem to be a very good reason to, to discount it. I agree. I tell you what, I promise not to say that silence proves there was no tomb if you promise not to say that the silence proves there was a tomb. Deal? I think we can go a little bit further than that. Uh-oh. You're going to break our deal in the very next sentence, aren't you? The fact that Paul has clearly stated that Jesus was buried and then raised um, implies that the place in which Jesus was buried was left empty afterwards. Sure, but there's absolutely nothing here to affirm that the place where Jesus was buried was a tomb. A tomb is just one of several ways that his body could have been buried. You think a lot is implied. That's where you hide in the implications. And so um, I think N.T. Wright made this point. You know, so it says um, that he was buried and then that he was raised on the third day. To add, and the tomb was found empty, would be a bit like saying, and you know, Cameron walked down the street and he used his feet. There's, there's no need at all for Paul to add that. That analogy doesn't hold. Walking on one's feet is the most common way for a human to walk, which is why it's redundant. But if a person walks some other way, like on their hands, then it is noteworthy and somewhat anticipated to be an included detail. In our last video, we established that the most common way for a crucifixion victim to be buried was in a mass grave or ditch grave. This was even affirmed by world-renowned resurrection-defending Christian scholars Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas. That was the typical practice of the Romans to do that. That's what happened to most people. So a tomb burial, while not unheard of, is the less frequent occurrence, making that situation more akin to someone walking on their hands. A mass grave is the mundane walking-on-feet routine that is the usual case and wouldn't need to be mentioned. We can turn to what the gospel sources um, have to offer us here. The story of Mary Magdalene accompanied by some other women early on the Sunday morning. They wanted to pay their respects and anoint the body. This will be important later. And this, the fact that it, it was women is, is something that has impressed most historians. Has it though? And the reason is fairly straightforward is just that we have plenty of ancient sources which give us a flavor of um, male attitudes towards the testimony of women. Hmm. Does everyone agree on that? James Crossley has a paper, biblical scholar um, in the UK, where he says things like, well, you know, um, 
female testimony in law courts wasn't actually as held in such low regard as we're sometimes led to believe. Why would court proceedings have any impact on a social phenomenon? What's most important in this case is not so much like testimony in a court case scenario. Okay, so this oft-repeated court observation is irrelevant. Gotcha. It's the delivery of divine revelation to women first rather than men. And the, the scholar Richard Borkham shows that, you know, it's, it's this that would be most offensive to, me, to Jewish men in the first century. Early Christianity had relatively little success winning Jewish converts. It was among the Gentiles that the religion really flourished. The Gospels weren't written in Hebrew or Aramaic. They were written in Greek. It sure doesn't seem like these stories were primarily focused on the opinions of Jewish men. If early Christians wanted to make up a story of the empty tomb, and, and they wanted to make it maximally sort of persuasive and believable to their contemporaries, then they would have every reason to uh, attribute the discovery of the empty tomb to some um, prominent male disciples like Peter and John. No. If they wanted to make it believable, they absolutely would have had to have used women as the first visitors to the tomb, since the known tradition was women first to the tomb. But rather than take my word for it, let's hear from best-selling Christian apologist, Pastor Tim Keller. It was quite a nasty thing to have to do. Uh, the, there was a, it was a cadaver, it was a, it was a, it was a dead body, it, it probably stank. It might have. Uh, it certainly was incredibly unpleasant. And so who did it? Slaves and women. Men, respectable men, never did anything like this. Go, you, go look it up in your commentaries. If you're setting a story in the 1960s and you need a hotel maid to discover a dead body or a phone operator to overhear something or a nurse to care for someone, you're going to make that character a female because it's most typical. It's most believable, regardless of any anti-female bias that exists in society. Another thing that skeptics have said is that, well, you know, the gospel authors had to invent female uh, witnesses at the empty tomb because the men had all fled. Why should a, a fictional empty tomb story feel constrained by, you know, actual facts? After all, it, it's, a, it's a fictional story. The author of a fictional story has maximal editorial freedom. Why would they not just say that the male disciples were there, even if they weren't? The Gospel of Mark was written 40 years after the death of Jesus. All scholars agree that there was a robust oral tradition about the life of Jesus before it was first written down. How else could there even be an early church otherwise? So, Mark's editorial freedom would necessarily have been severely constrained by what was commonly held in the oral tradition, or else the early church would have rejected his gospel as heretical, just like they did with dozens of other gospels written in the 1st and 2nd centuries. The legendary developments about Jesus didn't come primarily from the authors of the gospels, but rather in the collective Wild West of the first decades of Christianity when nothing was being written down and people were having casual conversations trying to recruit to the religion. There is no indication at all that the male disciples fled completely out of um, the surroundings of Jerusalem. And so, so I don't think that argument holds any weight either. If Romans posted guards at the tomb, as the Gospel of Matthew suggests, this would obviously be the last place the disciples would want to visit. If they knew where Jesus' tomb was, as they almost certainly would have done, if Jesus' tomb wasn't empty, if he was still in there, they would have just gone to it and shown that he was in there. Or an argument that people didn't know firsthand where Jesus was buried. You know, like what happened if he was tossed in a mass grave, the most common way that Roman crucifixion victims were buried. That was the typical practice of the Romans to do that. That's what happened to most people. I mean, there's a couple of other things as well that just kind of add to this likelihood. So one is the fact that if you look at the narratives, they're fairly simple stories with little embellishment. So if you look at the later apocryphal gospels a century or so after the, main, the, the canonical gospels, they say bizarre things like, they went to the tomb and a 
talking cross came out of the tomb and Jesus came out of the tomb with his head in the clouds, that sort of thing. All these very, very bizarre stories that clearly show a lot of embellishment. I do believe you made that up. Well, all good stories deserve embellishment. I don't know why you'd mention the non-canonical Gospels. Those just serve to highlight the fact that the legend of Jesus was growing in the decades before the Gospel of Mark and didn't stop growing and growing after the Gospel of Mark. Most Christians don't even know about these books. But actually, if you look at the Gospel accounts, there's very little embellishment. A little embellishment is in the eye of the beholder. The Gospel of Mark is the first written. It is the shortest, and actually ends with the women keeping the news secret, and contains no post-resurrection Jesus appearances at all. Matthew adds the guards at the tomb. An earthquake upgrades the men to a glowing angel, and adds a Jesus appearance. Luke adds Peter running to the tomb. Finally, John adds a shape-shifting Jesus. This is a growing legend. And the fact that the story continued to grow for decades after the Gospels that Callum finds to be reliable is a demonstration that in the first century, people were prioritizing sensational storytelling over historicity. If that's true with the non-canonicals, why would it not be true of the canonical? If you look at Matthew 28, it records the Jewish response. And the Jewish response isn't, you've lost the tomb, or you've got the wrong one, or that he's still in the tomb. The Jewish response is that the disciples had stolen the body. Well, you've got the gospel writers telling us about what their opposition was saying. We don't have the words of the opposition themselves. They didn't have the word straw man, but I'm sure the concept existed. I mean... It's something, but if you listened only to Max and Callum's podcast, where they later address some non-robust, rarely held ideas that are counter to the resurrection, you might be under the impression that those ideas are the common and strong ideas. And you'd be wrong. And similarly, if you look at later writings like Justin Martyr, he kind of suggests the early Jewish response was the same. Well... Justin Martyr quotes the Gospels throughout his writing, so he's hardly an independent source to corroborate the Gospels. Fun fact, when Justin Martyr quotes the Gospels, he doesn't use the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to reference them. He refers to them anonymously. It's almost like those names were attached to the Gospel at some point later in history. But I digress. And so that suggests that actually what the, the people who rejected Christianity did think was that disciples had stolen his body and that again attests to the fact that his tomb was found empty or it suggests that the average first century person who rejected christianity wasn't particularly interested nor well equipped to investigate wild claims beyond the gossip floating around in the marketplace stolen body you say sure seems reasonable how much for that fish one last thing i think i would add is the literary source from pliny the younger who talks about the early Christians and how they acted, and he talks about them singing hymns to Christ as a god, taking oaths to abstain from adultery and theft and that sort of thing. But he also says that on a fixed day they met. Here's the excerpt from Pliny's epistle to Trajan, written around 112 AD. They were wont, on a stated day, to meet together before it was light, and to sing a hymn to Christ as to a god. I've also seen it translated as certain day, what it is never translated as is Sunday. Pliny's phrasing doesn't even affirm or hint to a weekly gathering. It could be any interval. But nevertheless, it was still striking, I think, that they began to venerate Sunday as a holy day, and in time it began to be the main holy day for Christians at large. And this suggests that there must have been something that happened on the Sunday in particular. Or that early Christians came to believe that something happened on a Sunday. A sincere but mistaken belief in the resurrection equally explains this phenomenon. I think that suggests with quite considerable force that that really did happen on the Sunday and that the Gospels have recorded that accurately. Wow! You and I have extremely different standards of evidence. I think the empty tomb is probably one of the most important facts that must be established in, in, in a successful case for the resurrection. I agree. When will you be trying to do that? If you think about it, so if, if there is really, if there really was an empty tomb, okay, Jesus was buried, 
And then three days later, his tomb was found empty. You have to have some kind of explanation why that is, right? This is why skeptics are so bent on trying to either explain away or maybe forward objections to the empty tomb. I'm in no way bent on trying to explain away the tomb. I'm looking at the evidence for an empty tomb and simply finding it incredibly lacking outside of the initial claim. I hate to sound like a broken record, but the most likely way Jesus would have been buried is in a mass grave. That was the typical practice of the Romans to do that. That's what happened to most people. It is up to the Christian to provide evidence that some less likely scenario is the one we should accept. And that burden of proof has failed miserably in my view. That's enough for today. If part four is posted at the time you're watching this, click on the thumbnail to continue. If not, tap the thumbnail to dive into the Apologia vs. Jesus Resurrection playlist for much more on this topic. Happy Easter, everyone. Later.